Uh, well, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to present. I have, I think, three hours. There is a break in between. Uh, I'm going to go very slowly. You should feel free to ask questions at any time. If I think a question is taking me off piste, I'll, I'll just stop you and then we can talk about it later. And I'm happy also to stay behind after the second one to keep talking about things that should there be any interest. Okay? So what I, what I chose as the topic was the reduced form representation in mechanism design. There are a number of papers that have used it, uh, but to my view, the treatment of the reduced form tends to be mysterious. So what I want to emphasize is how does one arrive at the reduced form? And second, why should you care about using the reduced form? And so let me remind you of what we're doing when, we're, when we study a mechanism design problem. We're essentially solving an optimization problem with the twist that the relevant parameters are the private information of the agents. Okay? So we throw in incentive constraints to account for the fact that we don't have access to those parameters. And what are our decision variables? Our decision variables typically uh, is uh, we have one, we have a variable that depends on the entire profile of reports, which is the allocation variable. And then we have another variable, which is the payment variable, which again depends on the entire profile of reports. So just as a thought experiment, imagine we have N agents and M possible types. That means we have at least this many variables that we have to keep track of, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what is the reduced form doing? The reduced form is saying, you know, at the end of the day, you only need a smaller set of variables which sort of depend only on the type of an agent. So in other words, for each agent I, I have a variable that tells me how much they're going to get if they report T, their type. So that's a significant reduction in the number of variables that you have to work with. And potentially that could be useful when trying to analyze a problem. Now the question is how do you get, how do you arrive at that reduction? And what I want to do is I want to do that not in an abstract setup, but with a particular concrete example. Because I think if we work through an example, you, it's much easier to see the mechanics that you have to execute. The example I've picked is the inspection problem uh, proposed by uh, Ben Parath, Eddie Deckel, and Bart Lipman in 2011. Now, why did I pick this? I think it's a novel problem. Uh, I'd rather not pick Myerson's optimal auction. That's been done to death. Uh, the second reason I've picked it is the incentive constraints in this problem you will see are not particularly essential here. This allows me to focus on the reduced form aspect. Okay. This problem was originally not analyzed using the reduced form, so that those of you who are familiar with the paper by Ben Parath, Deckel, and Lipman, I hope will come away with the conclusion, oh, the reduced form was such a better way to do it than the way that Eddie and others did it. And as this talk is recorded, I hope you remember that, Eddie and Bart and <laughs> Elhanan. <laughs> okay. And those of you who have not read the paper, after you see the treatment here, I urge you to go back to look at the paper. I'm convinced you'll come away with the same conclusion that, uh, that they went about it uh, the long way. Okay? And finally, I wanted an example that was not knife edge. In other words, you should be suspicious of any example with the property that small perturbations kill off the technique. And uh, Yunnan has a paper, I think current date is 2017, in which she has actually ex uh, analyzed generalizations of this problem of Ben Parath, Deckel, and Lipman using the same techniques. So what I want to emphasize is, you know, I, I think the approach is not knife edge. Right? It's, okay. So what's the problem? So the, um, there's a good to be allocated. And uh, age... Only agents know the value of the good. That's their private information. Each agent would prefer to receive the good than not. So let me give you the story that Eddie and, uh, Eddie and his co-authors tell. I am a dean. I have a faculty position to allocate between, one faculty position to allocate between different departments. 
Only the departments know the true value of that faculty position to the school. But every department would rather have a faculty position than not. I, as the dean, would like to allocate the faculty position to the department for which will bring in the largest possible value to the school. Okay? So only the departments know the value. The departments don't really care about the value. They just want a faculty member, breathing or not. Okay? And the only instrument I have as the dean, since I don't have transfers, for some reason they're not permitted within a university, <laughs> the only instrument I have is that at a cost, I can inspect any claim you make about your value. And my inspection technology is perfect in the sense that uh, if you make a claim and I choose to inspect you, I will determine with 100% probability whether your claim was true or you were lying. Okay? But there's a cost in incurred from doing this. Okay? So that's my only instrument, inspection. And so I have a mechanism design problem in which I'd like to maximize the expected value of the allocation subject to incentive compatibility. So, sorry, I got the objective function wrong. Maximize the expected value of the allocation less the cost of inspection subject to incentive compatibility. Okay? N risk neutral agents. Types are independent draws, and I'm assuming types are discrete, one up to M, and F subscript T is the probability that an agent is of type T. Okay? And here is my cost of inspection. It's bigger than one. And if I incur this cost of inspection, I can correctly verify an agent's type report. Okay? That's the setup. OK. So what do I do? I announce two functions. One is my allocation rule which specifies what fraction of the object goes to each agent as a function of the profile of reported types. Fraction can be interpreted as probability if the good is indivisible. Right? And I have to specify an inspection rule as well, which is the probability that an agent will be inspected conditional on being allocated as a function of the profile of reported types. Okay? So those are my two sets of variables. Let's look at the allocation variable. And for simplicity, let's just focus on two agents to begin with. Okay? So I have two agents. Little a is my, sorry, that should be q. q is my allocation rule. And so here's my allocation rule defined formally. q subscript i t s is the probability the good is allocated to agent i when agent 1 reports type t and agent 2 reports type s. Okay? What are the only constraints on the allocation rule? Well, these quantities had, have to add up to at most one, and they have to be non-negative. Okay. Everyone with me so far? OK, now, what's the reduced form representation? The reduced form representation involves these interim allocation probabilities. So capital Q, superscript I subscript T, in words, it's the expected quantity that Mr. I receives when Mr. I reports type T. Okay? And here is what I just said algebraically. Okay? So look at that. This is Mr. 1. Mr. 1 reports type T. How much does he get on average? Well, if Mr. 2 reported S, this is how much he would get. This is the probability with which Mr. 2 will report S under the assumption of incentive compatibility. Right? Add this up over all possible reports of Mr. 2. That gives me the expected quantity that I will receive. Yes? Does it matter that uh, I agents are symmetric, so it's not identical? Uh, so the, the answer is it doesn't. But for simplicity, I'm going to assume symmetry. But I will put up later on relevant expressions for the asymmetric case. Right? OK. Now, what is the technical question we have, which is, I'd rather not work with the little Qs. I'd rather work with the big Qs. Now, the problem I have is that if you, if you give me a value for this one and you give me a value for this, how do I know that there exists a corresponding little Q? Right? So that's the implementability question, which is, if I give you a collection of big Qs, 
Does there exist a collection of little q's so that these equations are satisfied? Hmm? Everyone with me so far? Yeah. For the moment, the story of inspection has gone away. I'm focusing, remember my goal is, I don't want to work with these Qs. Think of N agents and M types, lots of them, right? I'd rather work with the big Qs and then I'll throw inspection back in. Right. Okay. Well, let me tell you what the answer is. So, and then I'll, then I'll explain how did anyone even arrive at this? or so how might you arrive at this answer? So I'm going to look at the case where the allocation rule is anonymous. In other words, doesn't depend on the name of the agents. So therefore, I want the interim allocation to Mr. I and the interim allocation to Mr. J only to depend on their reported type. Okay? And here is the result due to Border, Maskin, Matthews, and Riley. So to be safe, I've included every name that I'm aware of that is associated in any way, shape, or form with this result. Okay? Don't ask me for the entire history, that would take a bit longer, but here's the result, which is a collection of these capital Qs is implementable if and only if the following collection of inequalities is satisfied. Now, what I'd like you to notice is on the left-hand side, I've got N, which is the number of agents. In my example, it was two. I've got S, a subset of types. Okay? And over here, this is the probability that an agent has type T. And this is the interim expected quantity that an agent of type T gets. So if you look at the left-hand side, in words, it represents the expected quantity of the good that goes to agents whose types lie in the set S. Okay. Now, what do I have on the right-hand side? Well, here I have this summation. This is the probability that an agent's type is not in S. I've raised it to the power of n, and then I'm subtracting it from 1. So this must be the probability that there is at least one agent whose type lives in the set S. Right. So the, stated that way, the condition seems perfectly natural, which is the expected quantity of goods that go to agents whose type is in S cannot possibly exceed the probability that there is at least one agent whose type is in S. So if you look at this, it's not hard to see, okay, this is a necessary, so if you give me a bunch of capital Qs, a necessary condition for the capital Qs to be implementable is that they must satisfy this inequality for every subset of types. Okay? The hard part is showing that the reverse is true, that this is not only a necessary condition, but a sufficient condition. Okay? Now, at this point, you should be saying, wait a minute. The whole rationale for this enterprise was that I wanted to eliminate working with the little Qs because there were lots of them. I'm switching now to the big Qs. And now you're telling me, but wait a minute, to check whether a collection of capital Qs is implementable, I've got to worry about an exponentially large number of constraints. This doesn't seem to help at all at first glance. Okay, okay. Uh, we have something going for us. This object on the right-hand side, if you treat this as a real valued function of the subset S, has two nice properties. It is non-decreasing in the sense that if S is a subset of T, G of S is less than or equal to G of T. And the other crucial property is that it is submodular. Okay. Now, you asked about the asymmetric case. That's what the corresponding expression looks like. I've added a bunch of additional indices to account for the fact that the names of the agents matter. And I'm also allowing for the fact that each agent can have their own type space. Okay. This object on the right-hand side is still a submodular function and is still non-decreasing. It's a little harder to see, but just take that for granted. Okay. Okay. So uh, digression. Let me tell you something about submodularity. So I have a ground set, one up to n of elements. 
I have a real valued function defined on subsets of E. That function is non-decreasing if the following property is satisfied. Okay. And here is submodularity, which I think should be familiar to all of you. We typically interpret this as the discrete analog of concavity. Right. So in other words, uh, if T is a bigger set than S, if I add something to T, this is the discrete derivative, it is smaller than if I added that same thing to S. Okay. Now, why does that help us? This is a digression. Give me a monotone sub non-decreasing submodular function G. I can define a polymetro, I can define a polyhedron, uh, I can associate a polyhedron with it. Here it is. X is non-negative. Sigma XJ for J and S for every subset S is less than or equal to G of S. That's called a polyhed that's called a polymetroid. Okay. I'm interested in this linear programming problem. Maximize a linear function subject to X being in a polymetroid. Okay. Now, why is this optimization problem interesting? Well, one, it has a very simple solution. Order the elements by decreasing weight in the objective function. Okay. And now, greedily add the elements one at a time and maintain feasibility, and here's the way that you do that. So x1 will be equal to g of 1. This is the element with largest weight in the objective function. C1. X2 This is the element with second largest weight in the objective function. Keep going until you hit the last element that's bigger than or equal to zero. Everything beyond that is set to zero. So I'm not going to prove this. Submodularity guarantees that this choice of x's is feasible. Okay. That's a little piece of algebra involving the submodularity property. Okay. How do you prove that this collection of variables is in fact optimal? And the answer is, you one of the ways you do that is by constructing a corresponding dual solution and verifying complementary slackness. Okay. So now, why have I taken this digression? Ignore for the moment the incentive compatibility constraints. As a mechanism designer, I'm choosing these interim allocation probabilities to optimize some function of them, typically linear. So at the end of the day, I have maximize a linear function subject to these constraints, but these constraints happen to be polymetroids. So therefore, that problem of maximizing a linear function subject to these constraints admits a greedy solution, ignoring, of course, incentive compatibility. Okay. Now, why should I care about a greedy solution? Okay. Well, the greedy solution can be interpreted in a very simple way in many economic contexts as a kind of priority rule, which is typically the objective coefficients, you know, they match the types, High types get higher objective coefficients. So you end up with an allocation rule that says, give it to the highest type first. Whatever is left over, give it to the next highest type, and so on. In other words, we get the kinds of rules that we know and love, priority rules. You can add additional constraints to these polymetroids and preserve this priority rule property. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of economic context, you should look at the paper by Che, Kim, and Mierendorfer, which, uh, which identifies these. I won't spend time on these additional side constraints. Let me tell you something else that you also get from the polymetroid. Remember, the choice of objective function here was arbitrary. And in a linear program, for any choice of objective function, there exists an optimal solution at one of the extreme points. 
What does that tell me? It tells me that every extreme point of the polymetroid is characterized by a priority rule. You simply choose the priorities over the types. Now that means every fractional solution must be a convex combination of priority rules. Okay? So, that was the digression. Okay. Okay, I should have said that's not quite. Uh, one last thing I have to fill up. I convert to the capital Qs. I solve the problem in the capital Qs. I get the values for the capital Qs. But then you can say to me, but wait a minute, I care about the little Qs. The capital Qs only tell me what everyone gets on average. It doesn't tell me who's supposed to get what. So is there an easy way to recover the little Qs? The answer is yes. And in fact, this is an old trick from the stochastic scheduling literature, which was the first literature to look at reduced forms. Okay? And I'll come back to this in the second part when I discuss reduced forms for dynamic mechanism design problems. But here's the trick. Um, look at your extreme point solution. Your extreme point solution corresponds to a set of priorities. Simply treat your QTs as priorities. So whichever agent has the highest interim allocation in any profile of types, they are the first priority for receiving the good. So that's how you re reco recover the little Qs. Okay. Okay. Now, where on earth did this polymetroid come from other than divine insight? So let me show you how you might approach it from first principles. So again, to keep things simple, let's look at two agents, two possible types. I've written down here the type space of agent one, T and T prime. The type space of agent two, S and S prime. The first four inequalities you see are the feasibility inequalities for an allocation rule. Right, so at any profile of types, the total quantity allocated can ex cannot exceed one. Now, what are the second four equations? The second four equations define the interim allocation probabilities. Okay. Now, what is my task? My task is to take this system of inequalities and equations and eliminate the little Qs so that I end up with a system just involving the capital Qs. Okay. What I've done is I've given you an algebraic interpretation. This should have been Q, I apologize. I've given you an algebraic interpretation of what we're trying to do. Here is a geometric one which is, I have a polyhedron in the little Q and the capital Q space. I want to take that polyhedron and project it into the capital Q space alone. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Next digression, projections. So, let's first look at algebraic, eliminate the little q variables. Now, if these were all equations, and I asked you to eliminate the little q variables, you would know what to do. We learn it at mother's knee. Right? We take one variable, write it in terms of the other, and then substitute out that one variable and repeat until we're just left with the little q's. Agreed? Okay. But I have inequalities here. Now, it is a puzzle that many generations of school children never stop to ask their teachers, how does one do elimination when there are inequalities? Okay. Any idea on how you do elimination of variables of inequalities? So it turns out that Fourier was the first one to figure this out. 
So let me describe Fourier's method of elimination. Let's do it with an example. Here's a collection of inequalities. I want to eliminate the variable x1. So here is what Fourier said you do. Take every inequality and rewrite it so that the variable that you want to eliminate is on one side only. Oh, I need this to make this interesting. I need that. Sorry. Okay, uh, now make sure that the signs align. So I'm going to multiply through by negative one. Agreed? And now what Fourier says you do is simply replace these x1s with the following collection of inequalities. This bigger than this this bigger than this. Agreed? And that eliminates x1. All right. Now notice if I had 2n inequalities and n over 2 of them were in this direct with positive coefficient for x1 and sorry not and n of them had a positive coefficient for x1, and n had a negative coefficient for x2, when I eliminate the variable x1, I would be replacing it with n squared inequalities, right? Because one inequality from the other one, from the top, another inequality from the bottom, this one has to be bigger than or equal to this one. And I have to do that for every pair. Okay, so this tells us that when we do this elimination step, when we eliminate a variable, we may potentially be adding in lots of additional inequalities. Okay. Okay. But you can do the elimination, so this is not, a, this is not an efficient algorithm by any means, okay. but it is the first algorithm for solving a linear program. Because you could introduce a variable for the objective function and then just eliminate everything else but that variable. Okay. okay. That's the algebraic interpretation. Now let me do the geometric, and you will see the geometric is essentially the algebraic, as it always is. Right? Okay. So supposing I have a polyhedron that li lives in the xz space, and it's described in this way. In our application, the x will correspond to the little q, sorry, the x will correspond to the big q, and the z will correspond to the little q. I want to know what the projection of this polyhedron is in the x space. So here's my polyhedron. I want a description of this. Okay. Okay, here's the theorem. Uh, let C subscript K be the following object. What is it? It's a polyhedral cone. What is it in words? It's the set of all vectors so that if you pre-multiply the matrix B by U, you get zero. In words, it's the set of row operations on the matrix which kills off the Z variables. Okay. 
What is the projection into the X space? It's the collection of following inequalities. So for every U in C subscript K, which is a cone, so for every vector in the cone U, you work out one of these inequalities. Where does this inequality come from? Multiply the left-hand side by U on both sides. UB disappears. Okay. Now, if you, want, if you had inequalities here, the only difference would be that this would be greater than or equal to. If you think about the usual rules of duality, right? So equality constraints unrestricted side, inequality constraints, then the variable becomes non-negative. Okay? Okay. Now, you may say this is not terribly helpful because a polyhedral cone could contain a continuum of vectors. And the answer is not really. We don't have to worry about that because we have another theorem that tells us every polyhedral cone is characterized by its extreme rays. In other words, there exists a finite set of vectors for which everything in the cone is a non-negative linear combination of those extreme rays or generators. Here's the picture you should have in your mind. Here's a cone. These are the two extreme rays. Everything in the cone is a non-negative linear combination of the extreme rays. Yes? Oh, uh, yes, you're right. I'm sorry. This should be less than or equal to. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I think. Ah, OK. No, yeah, I understand now what happened, which is I couldn't decide whether I should write it down for the equality version or the inequality version. And, <laughs> and so I did both. <laughs> okay. But what I want to point out, yeah, but really the takeaway that, that here is that, look, at the end of the day, we're simply doing row operations to eliminate the B matrix, right, when we do the projection. Okay. Now, is this theorem at all useful? The answer is maybe. Okay. All right. So let me tell you, so in practice, how is this theorem useful? Uh, it... So if I have no idea what the reduced form is, this is useful in the sense that it tells me what row operations I should be playing with. So it gives me a start. I make some guesses as to U, and that generates a bunch of inequalities. And if you generate enough, you hope that they give you inspiration for you to guess what the reduced form is, and then subsequently go back and verify. Okay? The second way it's useful is if you have an idea of what the reduced form should be, then you can come back to this and say, well, I can use this to prove that it is indeed the reduced form. Okay? But this is not terribly useful if you want to use this to actually derive the reduced form. Because working out the generators of a polyhedral cone are a pain. Okay? So it's helpful, but not terribly useful. OK. So I know what I need to do. I need to do row operations to eliminate the little q variables. Okay. So what am I going to do? Well, the little q variables here don't have the same coefficients as the one here. So let's do some multiplication. So I'm going to multiply the top equation through by the probability of that profile. Then I'm going to do it for all the other four inequalities. Okay, I've got Ft times Fs times Q1. Over here, I've only got Fs times Q1. Well, I can fix that, multiply this through by Ft as well. Okay, repeat. Now I've got this. Too much notation. Let's do a substitution. So I'm going to let the variable x stand for fu times fv times little q. I get this, neta. And what I'd like you to notice now is that this variable appears here. This variable appears here. And the same is true for all the other variables. So now I'm good to go in terms of elimination because presumably I want to negate these and add this to this so as to kill off the x variables. Okay? Now, you might, at this point, you should be saying, okay, this is well and good if I have 
two agents and two types. You, know, <laughs> you cannot possibly expect me to do this with n agents and m types. Okay, okay. digression number two. Three, sorry, I got the number, yeah, no, number two, zero, one, and two. Okay, right. The hitchcock koopmans transportation problem. Okay. There is a set of supply nodes where each supply node has a supply SI, each demand node has a demand DJ, and you have a set of edges directed from supply nodes to demand nodes. So not every supply node is necessarily connected to every demand node. Okay. Let xij be the flow from supply node i into demand node j through the edge ij. A flow is feasible if it satisfies the following, which is the total flow out of supply node i cannot exceed the available supply. So notice I'm summing this up over all demand nodes that are connected to I by an edge. And this says that the total flow into demand node J must be exactly equal to the demand of node J. Hmm? Notice I'm summing this up over all supply nodes that have an edge directed into J. Okay? And of course the flows must be non-negative. Okay? Now, how do I know there's a feasible solution to this system? Well, one necessary condition must be that total supply is at least as large as total demand. Otherwise, we're not even in the game. Okay? But you can easily see that's not enough. Why? Because not every supply node is connected to every demand node. Okay? Okay. Well, there's a result that is essentially a generalization of Hall's matching theorem that characterizes when a feasible flow exists. Okay? So take any subset of demand nodes and define n of t to be the set of supply nodes that feed those demand nodes. So this is the set of supply nodes that have an edge pointing into a node in t. Okay? And here's the theorem. A feasible flow exists if and only if for every subset of demand nodes the supply of all nodes that feed vertices in T is at least as large as the aggregate demand of the nodes in T. Okay? So those of you who know Hall's marriage theorem, S and D are all one. Okay? Now why is this digression relevant? Demand, supply. I can think of each of these as a supply node. So every profile of types is a supply node. Every interim allocation is a demand node. Probability flows out of a profile into the demand nodes. What is beautiful about this result is it gives us feasibility, translation, it's eliminated the x variables because the condition only depends on the s's and the d's. Why is that relevant to us? Because our demand is the big q's. Right. So this generalization of Hall's theorem does the projection for us. Right. So instead of doing the messy linear algebra and the elimination, I simply go I simply go to Hall's theorem, and I say, what does it say? It says over here, for every subset of types, look at the sum of the demands. That's these guys. These are the expected quantities. That should be less than or equal to the probability of a profile feeding that type. And submodularity comes from this. So it's well known that a function defined on the neighbors of a graph, neighbors of a vertices of a graph, of a sub, that a function, an additive function defined on the subset of vertices that are in the neighborhood of another subset is submodular. 
Uh, again, it's a, it's a simple exercise to do that, but that's where the submodularity is coming from. Right? Okay. So this gives us border, Matthews, border, Matthews, Maskin, borders, Riley. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Now let's actually put it to work and throw in the incentive constraints and see if we get anything. So Q subscript T, I'm assuming that when names of agents don't matter. Okay. Q sub T is the interim allocation probability to type T. One minus C of T is the probability of checking a report of type T conditional on the good being allocated to type T. Total value less the cost of inspection is given by this. So this is the probability an agent is of type T. T is their type. This is the interim allocation to that type less the cost of inspection. Capital K is the cost of inspection. Everyone agreed with that? Okay. So I want to maximize this. Okay. So notice, I, simpli I rewrote this as this. I want to maximize this. Here's my incentive constraint. So let's see what it says. Pick an agent. Remember, an agent just cares about being selected. All right. So if my type is T, this is my interim probability of being selected. What if I pretend to be type S? Well, if I pretend to be type S, then I have to worry about me being inspected. If I'm inspected, I never get the good. Okay? So the only way misreporting my type is going to benefit me is if I misreport and I am not inspected. Well, the probability I'm not inspected is C of S. Because if I misreport to type S, my probability of not being inspected is C of S. Let me remind you from the choice. See, I said 1 minus C is the probability of being inspected. So C is the probability of not being inspected. Okay. Incentive compatibility says my probability of being selected if I report truthfully should exceed my, probability, my expected probability of being selected if I misreport. And this has to be true for all pairs of types. And over here, well, my probability of not being inspected has to be between 0 and 1 because it's a probability. I'm working with interim allocation probabilities, so they better correspond to a feasible allocation rule. And that's the board, Mask, Matthews, Maskin, Riley, board, some co border from now on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Border et al. Okay. Okay. Now, at this point, I'm in tears because although I've got my polymetroid here, my objective function, unfortunately, is not linear. I've got two variables in there, Q and C, and they're multiplied by each other. Okay, not a problem. Let's look at the incentive constraints a little more carefully. Let me just rewrite them like this. First observation. I should never bother anyone, I should never bother to inspect anyone who says that their value is one. Why? Because I assume the cost of inspection was bigger than one. It's just inefficient. So that tells me that C of 1, the probability of not being inspected when you have the lowest type, is 1. Okay. So that gives me this, Q1 less than or equal to Q2, QT. How do I know that? Um, put S equal to 1 into this inequality. Okay. So in words, all types higher than the lowest type must have a higher interim probability of receiving the good. 
Okay? And so now let's go back to the incentive constraint and rewrite it this way. C of S is less than or equal to QT of QS. Well, this observation tells me that most of these inequalities are redundant. The only inequality that matters is that one. Right? Because C of S has to be less than or equal to this for any T. And the smallest possible T is going to be the bottleneck inequality. So C of S is less than or equal to Q1 over QS. Okay? There's my optimization problem. Now, if I look at this, I want to maximize. The C appears with a positive coefficient, so I'd like to make it as large as possible. Okay, so natural thing to do is push C of T up to this, right-hand side. But wait a minute, C of T also has to be smaller than 1. So really, C of T should be below the minimum of these two. However, Q1 is always smaller than QT. So therefore, this constraint is also irrelevant. And that means I can just write C of T as Q1 over QT. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to plug that in. And there's my optimization problem. I've eliminated the C variable, linear function, polymetroid. Ah, still one additional constraint. Okay. okay, not a problem. Fix Q1. To what? No idea. It's a parameter that I will choose later. Then write every Q sub T as X subscript T plus Q1. Okay. Replace the QTs by the X's. So wherever I see a QT, I replace it with an XT plus Q1. So I can eliminate this constraint now because I'm working with X's. Right. Over here, well, the Q1s are going to be collected and I have to take them over to the right-hand side. If I take them over to the right-hand side, what do I get? I get this object. Okay. I'm going to call this H of S. What do I know about H of S? Well, G of S is submodular. This is modular. So therefore, this is submodular. Is it monotone? Because I need that to be able to use the greedy algorithm. Well, the answer is, if Q1 is small enough, this thing is monotone. How do I know that Q1 is small enough? Well, Q1 less than this works. How do I know this is the right upper bound on Q1? Well, this is also the upper bound necessary to make sure that H of S is non-negative. If H of S is negative, I've got an infeasible problem because the X's have to be non-negative. Okay. So what do I have? I've now got maximize a linear function. Remember, Q1 is a parameter that I will fix later. So it's fixed for the moment. So maximize a linear function subject to a polymetroid. Okay. How do I know polymetroid? Admittedly, I've got FT times XT. Replace that by ZT. And there's my problem. Okay. okay, now, what I've done is I've taken, the, I've taken originally what seemed like a nonlinear problem and turned it into a problem of maximizing a linear function over a polymetroid. So wonderful, there's a greedy algorithm to solve it. But this is, so far, entirely uninteresting. If my only goal was to write down an optimization problem, then I could have stopped much earlier. Why are we bothering to do this? Presumably we do this because we want some kind of qualitative insight. So what on earth is an interesting qualitative insight in this problem? So let's step back a bit from the algebra and see what the principle should be concerned with. If agents report very low types, it's clearly not worth inspecting them. In which case, how should you allocate the good? You just might as well randomly assign it. So one thing without any algebra that we can see is that if the types are small, below some threshold to be determined later, we should just randomly allocate the good. Okay. Now, I'd like to give the good to the department that will generate the highest value from the good. So a natural thing to consider is, why don't I prioritize departments that announce a high value? Now, the catch, of course, is that everyone has an incentive to exaggerate the value of, of receiving the good. 
So I have to discourage people from exaggerating. How can I do that? Well, one, I could threaten to inspect. But inspection is costly. Is there anything else I can do? The answer is yes, I can ration. I actually have two instruments to control exaggeration, which is I can threaten to inspect you, or I can threaten to ration you. Which of these instruments is the right instrument that I should be using? That's the interesting economic question. Right? So why do I care about being able to write down the problem as maximize a linear function subject to a polymetroid? It's because there's a straightforward algorithm, the greedy algorithm, and if I look at the greedy algorithm, I should be able to answer this question of whether I should ration or whether I should inspect. Okay? That's the reason I care about all of these derivations. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what do I know about the greedy algorithm? Well, it's going to organize these by priority. What's the priority going to depend on? It's going to depend upon the coefficient of that variable in the objective function. Now, notice, if t is less than k, the coefficient is negative. By the greedy algorithm, I never choose that variable. So the corresponding zt variable is zero. Now, remember, just because zt is zero doesn't mean I don't allocate to that type. Remember, qt was xt plus q1. Everyone gets at least as high a probability of receiving the good as the lowest possible type. Okay? So what this means is there is some threshold, I don't particularly care where, where if all types are below that threshold, they all receive the same probability of winning the good. Okay? Okay. Okay. What else do I get from the greedy algorithm? Higher types get a higher priority than lower types. And then, and then if you back out, it works out that if you allocate the good, you're going to inspect somebody with probability one. So in other words, what this mechanism tells me without doing any more algebra is there's a threshold below. If all types are below that threshold, I allocate randomly. If there are types above that threshold, I go to the highest type, I give it to them, but then I inspect. That's the mechanism. Okay? Any questions? Now, what are some of the possible variations that you could imagine? Well, one variation you could imagine is the following, which is, wait a minute, this assumption that when I withhold the object, I'm essentially... The, the, I can withhold the object if uh, you lie, essentially assumes that I'm capable of sort of unlimited punishment in the event that you lie. So you might ask, what happens if the punishments I can levy are limited? That's one variation that you can consider. Another variation you could consider is, what if there's not just one position to be allocated, but k positions? Okay. The same machinery can be used, and you can ask Yunan about that, to derive these kinds of to derive mechanisms for these for these settings. Okay. Yes. Do you allow inspect the first guy sort of Yes. So one implementation is inspect the first guy. If they if they found to be lying, then you go to the next one down the list and so on. Right. Yeah, it's That's optimal, yeah. Okay. 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 Now, this example, this example relied on, in some sense, two pieces of good fortune. One, a, ready, a readily available theorem <laughs> that allowed you to work out the reduced form. In other words, the generalization of Hall's theorem allowed you to do the projection operation with no effort. Right? The second piece of good fortune is that the resulting description of the reduced form was a polymetroid, a polyhedron with nice properties. Okay. Is this going to be true always? No. It just, it just cannot be, okay? So 
And the reason, the reason we, we benefit from this good fortune is that because our, our original set of variables involving the little Qs were fairly simple. Don't give out more than you have. If you have things that are more complicated, I cannot promise you that this machinery will give you a reduced form that is one, both in some sense interpretable and easy to characterize, and two, easy to work with. If your problem is hard, it's going to remain hard. The reduced form doesn't make it easy. The reduced form just gives you a different perspective on the same object. Okay. Now, I did this for discrete types, and you might wonder, does this carry over to the continuum? And the answer is, in this case, yes. So the characterization of border masking et, et al., the first published characterization was for a continuum of types. And essentially what you do is, in, what, in the slides that I've shown you, wherever you see a summation, replace it with an integral. Okay? <laughs> and everything goes through. Okay, so now some history. So my understanding is it was Steve Matthews who first conjectured the reduced form representation and showed that it was necessary. I believe Maskin and Riley in a very special case proved that it was sufficient. And then it is finally Border in his Econometrica paper that gives the full characterization for a continuum of types. And, uh, but all of this development completely ignores the fact that what they're working with is a polymetroid. So all of the proofs are done from first principles. Okay. And then subsequently, Border, in a paper in economic theory about 15 years ago, did the characterization for the discrete type case, again, ignoring the fact that what he has was a polymetroid, because one of the things he emphasizes is the connection between this and priority rules. And, but once you recognize that what you're working with is a polymetroid, the priority rules come out for free, right? which is that the extreme points correspond to priority rules. Anything that's feasible is a convex combination of extreme points, so on and so forth. Right? So that's the history of the reduced form representation. Uh, you could have used, you can use the reduced form representation to derive Myerson's optimal auction result. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you replace the allocation rule by the interim allocations, and then you use the incentive compatibility constraints to write the payment variables in terms of the allocation variables. So now you have a linear function subject to polymetroid, and you get the priority result where the priorities correspond to the virtual values. Okay. Using, this, uh, using, the, using the reduced form representations, as I mentioned earlier, you can add other kinds of constraints and, thing, and you can still work things out. So budgets, uh, quotas, things like that still allows you to use the same machinery. Okay. Now the problem, the examples that I mentioned and the problem that I described here were all static. So now you might say, could one use this machinery for dynamic problems? Right. And I think the answer is yes. So I'm going to give you an example recently worked out by a student, Marcos Epitropu and myself. And you can interpret this as the dynamic version of the Ben Porath Deckel Lippmann problem. So imagine it is not n departments all at once asking for a slot, but one department at a time. Okay? So I picked that example because it matches with this example that I've described here, and it's simple enough that I think that I can, that I can do it in the time allotted. There is a more elaborate example involving multi arm bandits that you can also do with reduced form. So in other words, there's a reduced form way of doing the kinds of dynamic mechanism design problems discussed in Pavan, Siegel, Troika. Okay, and um, if I have time, I'll do that. Okay, so let's see, nine to 10, okay. So I want to describe first what is called the secretary problem. There are a variety of variants, terrible phrase. Um, there are a number of versions, okay. I'm going to focus on what's called the cardinal version. Many of you may be more familiar with the ordinal version, which I'll mention in passing. 
sequence of boxes numbered 1 up to n. You're going to inspect the boxes one at a time in the order given. My apologies. Okay. When you open a box, let's say box i, it contains a random number ti. So I'm going to use the word number and type interchangeably. Okay. And that number appears with a certain probability. Okay. So when you open a box, the reward you get is random. Okay. Upon inspecting a box, you can choose to reject the draw and move to the next box or keep the draw and stop. Okay. What's your goal? Maximize the expected value of the number selected. It's a classic stopping problem. Okay. And you can easily throw an incent a mechanism design problem onto this by treating, by treating, let's say, the box as an agent revealing a type. Okay, actually, so before we, so uh, classic stopping problem, if you look at a number of books in stochastic processes, they may have this problem as an exercise in which uh, you're asked to work out what the optimal policy is. So let's spend a little bit of time hand-waving what an optimal policy would look like. It's fairly obvious that it has to be a threshold rule, right? I open a box, I look at the number, should I keep it? Well, it depends on what I think I will get in the remaining boxes. If it's bigger than what I think I'll, in, my expected reward from the remaining boxes is going to be, then I should keep the number and go home. Otherwise, I should reject the number, go to the next box. Right? So what's the challenge here? The challenge is, okay, I've got to work out the expected reward from inspecting the remaining boxes. But that's the usual dynamic programming recursion. So we're in familiar territory. Tedious, but it can be done. Okay? Yeah. I don't want to do it that way. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to write down, I'm going to write down first what I think are the natural allocation variables, and then move to a reduced form representation, and then optimize over the reduced form representation. Right. Why do I want to do it that way? Because when I add in incentive constraints, perhaps I can mimic the analysis from earlier. Okay. Okay, so what might the natural variables be? Well, here is one guess. Zi of ti is the probability with which you choose ti, so that means the type drawn from box i, given that you've rejected the i minus one previous boxes. So I claim that's an allocation rule. Now you might say, wait a minute, that seems a little incomplete because apparently I'm ignoring the entire history. Right? Because you might say, surely the correct allocation rule should be What's the probability that I choose TI given that I saw T1 from box 1, T2 from box 2, TI minus 1 from box I minus 1? Okay. Well, the reason I can ignore this history is because I know what the objective function is. The objective function only depends on the number that I keep. And assuming that the draws from the boxes are independent of each other, who cares what numbers I got from the previous draws? Okay? So I'm making life a little simpler for myself here by invoking the objective function that I have in mind. Right? Okay. The only constraint I should have is that zi of ti is between 0 and 1. Okay? So that's my, those are my, alloc that's my allocation variable. Right? Right. Just a little piece of notation. Uh, F subscript 1 colon i minus 1, t subscript 1, colon i minus 1. Basically, what is the probability of seeing that particular profile of types? And notice I'm assuming independence across boxes, so it's a product. Now, what would an interim allocation probability be? Well, qi of ti is the interim allocation probability to type ti. So, Mr. Rye reporting TI. That's the probability that I choose TI, and that's given by this. So, the probability of selecting TI if I ever get to box I, multiplied by the probability that I rejected everything else on all histories. Okay. 
Okay. What I want to do is work with the capital Qs, not these guys. Right? I could write down maximize a linear function subject to these z variables. Okay. But they're a pain to work with. Okay? So I'm going to take this expression here and rewrite it by taking this stuff in the summation over here into the denominator that way. Now here's a claim. My claim is that zi of ti can actually be written this way. Notice I'm replacing the denominator, which involves the actual allocation variables, with the interim allocation variables. How do I know that that's true? Actually, the proof is by induction. Right. If you look at this, it's a, it's a, I, didn't, I didn't put in the algebra here because it's a little tedious. I mean, not deep and not even particularly complicated. But if you stare at this long enough, you realize, wait a minute, this is the expression for this guy, one index lower. So now what I'm going to do is, wait a minute, I had only one constraint on the z's, that they be between 0 and 1. So replace this by this object is less than or equal to 1 and bigger than or equal to 0. What does that translate into? This. There's the reduced form. Now, it has a nice interpretation. This is the expected quantity allocated to the boxes before me. This is the expected quantity promised to me when I say I'm type I. In expectation, that cannot exceed the available supply. QITI is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay. So now, if I wanted to solve the secretary problem, I have now a fairly straightforward optimization problem which is maximize my linear function, the expected reward, which now is just a function of the TIs, right? It would be TI times QI of TI, summed over all the Is. So maximize that subject to this. So, and in fact, how many variables do I have? Well, I have for every box and for as many possible types that there are in each box. No dynamic programming. I mean, there's dynamic programming essentially hidden into the, in the linear program, but I don't have to do it. Okay. okay. Now, let me show you how you can derive what's known as a profit inequality. Right. So this is the optimal offline problem, meaning what if, by chance, I could tell what was in each box and then choose the best number? So in the literature on profit inequalities, this is called the profits problem. Now, if you think about that problem, it's really just the, it's just the auction problem. Each box is an agent. Each agent has a type. Type is drawn from a random number. I wish to give the object to the agent with the highest type. Well, that's this. Maximize the total expected value of the allocation. But since it's an auction problem, the relevant interim allocations satisfy the border constraints. Here I've written down a simplified version of the border constraints that assumes that the interim allocations are monotone. That's why it has less notation than the one I put up earlier. Okay. How do I know it's... Well, the answer is we know that the allocation rule has to be monotone. That's why I've... Okay. Over here is the online problem where I have to inspect the boxes one at a time and then decide whether to stop. So maximize total value subject to the constraints for the online problem. Okay, okay now the original profit inequality made the following assertion. The optimal objective function value of the online problem is at least half the value of the optimal objective function value of the offline problem. Interpretation. 
I can do at least half as well as the prophet who knows what number is in each box. Now, when I think it's Esther Khan who first proved this, uh, the proof is a little long. I'm going to give you, I'm just, I'm going to use this to sh give you a very short proof, okay? Um, it came as a bit of su a surprise because it, it's, if you think about it, it's sort of hard to imagine that if you have to open the boxes sequentially, that you could get anywhere close to the optimal offline. Because surely you have to sometimes make huge mistakes. Right? Okay. An economic interpretation of this would be a seller who has to sell in an online fashion can achieve at least half the revenue of the seller who can get all the, auction, auction, all the bidders in the room at one time. Okay? So here's the proof. Let Q star be the optimal solution to the offline problem. Define a new solution to be Q star divided by 2. I'm going to argue that Q star divided by 2 is a feasible solution to the online problem. That's the proof. Okay. If I can convince you of that, I'm done. Agreed? Okay. okay. Suppose not then it must violate one of the constraints. Suppose it violates this one. Well, remember Q is Q star divided by two, so replace the Q by Q star, take the two from the denominator into the right-hand side. Right. But these Q stars, they're a solution to the offline problem. What do we know about them? They have to be less than one. So this has to be smaller than 1. What about this guy? Well, this guy, less than 1. So therefore, the left-hand side is less than 2. But it must be bigger than 2 contradiction. Okay, so now let's do the online version of Ben Parath, Deckel, Lipman. So I'm only going to go as far as setting up the problem, uh, just to convince you that it's the same technology as earlier. Okay. QIK is the probability of allocating the item to agent I, condition on the event that type K was realized. Okay. CIK is the probability that agent I will not be inspected when he declares type K. So I'm summing over the boxes or the agents and then summing over the possible types of each agent. This is the probability the agent has type K. I'm doing this basically for the IID case, but you can throw in more notation for the non-IID case. Interim allocation to Mr. I if they report K and then this is their type, and then this, is, this picks up the cost of inspection. Okay. This is the incentive compatibility constraint for Mr. I. Probability of not being inspected cannot be more than one. And here are the inequalities that capture the reduced form. Okay. They're not polymetroids or anything like that. Well, once again, we don't want to inspect the lowest type. Uh, once again, I can remove a bunch of the incentive compatibility constraints, and then I can use that to eliminate the C variables. So now I have a linear program. OK. Once again, we should ask ourselves, we're going through this exercise, what is it that we're hoping to learn? Well, the fact that we've made the problem dynamic, what might we expect should change? It's going to be terribly dull if nothing changes. Right. 
So in the static case, what did we see? Types below a certain threshold uh, allocated the good at random. Above the threshold, we highest priority to the highest type, inspect, then we're done. Okay. Well, now let's think about box number one. Supposing the type is, that's reported is low. Should we still allocate the object? The answer is no. Now there's an opportunity cost to allocating the object, which is if you give it to box number one, you may not be able to give it to box number two. Right. So what's the wrinkle that you get here is that actually in the earlier boxes, if the type falls below a certain threshold, you don't allocate. It's only in the last box that if the type is below the threshold that you allocate randomly. Here's an example of a dynamic problem. Pro pro yeah. And now notice, I didn't spend much time on the dynamic problem because all of the work was already done with the static. Right. So this is one of the nice features of the reduced form representation. And I'm going to have time, I think, to show you in the multi-arm bandit um, that once you've done the work for the static case, you've pretty much done the work for the dynamic case. So I know I had an hour and a half, but I think I'd rather stop here because I think this is just the right uh, place to stop. And, uh, and why not, uh, yes, and then we reconvene when? Yes. 10, okay. Wait, is it 20-minute break? 30-minute break, okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, that's allowed for in this setup where I inspect and then I, I pull the object back if you are found to have lied. And then the, the problem stops after that? No, no, no. The, you, can, you can still reallocate, right? But if you have the incentive compatibility constraints, that's not going to happen, right? Right. 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 So, that's the, so the incentive compatibility constraints help in terms of making the problem easy. Right, you move on to the next box. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Between zero and one, that's correct. But, uh, but in, in this, uh, oh. Right here, right? So here I had Q between 0 and 1. Did I use the fact that Q... Okay, so a setting where you may want Q to take on negative values would, for example, be bi bilateral bargaining, right? Where you could interpret, um, you could interpret Q positive... Okay, so here's another way to think about the bilateral bargaining setup. It's an auction problem where one agent's type is between zero and one, and the other agent's type is between zero and minus one. And you're running an auction, but the variable Q can now be both positive or, or negative, corresponding to buying and, 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 and selling. Same machinery will go through. The fact that the little Qs are non-negative was not essential. Right. I mean, it's going to affect, it's, it's, go, it's going, so the, Let me answer your question, I think, in a way that may be more useful. When I described a polymetroid, I described it in terms of variables being non-negative, right? Okay. So let me just write down again. Right?
Now, in the case of two variables, what would a polymetroid look like? That would be an example of a polymetroid in two dimensions, right, with the non-negativity constraints. If I remove the non-negativity constraints, all that's going to happen is that I'm going to open up this region and open up this region. As long as I'm maximizing a linear objective function with non-negative coefficients, right, the optimal solution is still going to occur someplace here. Right? Now, if you have negative coefficients in your objective function, then you're going to pick, then the problem, the optimization problem is going to have an unbounded objective function value, right? So, uh, so in some sense, uh, so in other words, the fact that the variables are non-negative was really not essential given the kind of objective function that we were optimizing. If, uh, if you're going to have negative coefficients in your objective function, and you want to allow your variables to be non-negative, you're going to need additional constraints to make the problem well-behave. Okay? Now, the, typically what happens in these cases is that you may actually have an additional constraint that, that requires that one of these things be, typically the grand set holds at equality. So you must exactly allocate something. Right? So then in that case, you're basically living you're basically living just here. Okay. Now this object, if you impose this additional equality constraint, is called an extended polymetroid. Greedy algorithm still works. Uh, that's not an issue. Okay. 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 okay, thanks very much. <laughs>